so I don't know if this one will be any better, if it will get you any more excited. Maybe I wasn't enthusiastic enough last time. Uh, but for this last lecture, we're going to take similar ideas and extend them into the forecast realm. So the last talk was about how can we quantify the impact the observations have on the analysis. Now we're going to look at uh, the impact of uh, the observations on the forecast. All right, last one. And uh, not just about how to improve forecasts, but I'll show you an example of how to use uh, these tools to understand the system dynamics. And, you know, it, it's, it's peculiar to the things that I've looked at, so maybe it's idiosyncratic and not relevant to the sorts of things that you do, but hopefully it's illustrative of the main point, which is data simulation gives you access to these tools to understand your system. Okay, yeah, so the plan here is to go through the theory first and then look at some examples uh, for dynamics and forecast improvement. And then the very last thing I'll talk about is something we call ensemble forecast adjustment. And this is a way to uh, improve forecasts on the fly as new observations come in. Okay, so forecast sensitivity theory has a historical background to it. Uh, the key milestones and papers that I'm aware of, um, this I think really caught fire in the early to mid 1990s. There was a weather field campaign over the North Atlantic Ocean to look at uh, developing storms that affect Europe. And they're called frontal cyclones. They develop along frontal boundaries, temperature boundaries over the North Atlantic. And these systems can often be fast growing, and since they're in the jet stream, they move very rapidly off to the east. And there was an emerging theory at that time which suggested that it may be possible to figure out in advance where new measurements would have the biggest impact on later forecasts. So for example, if we saw through some technique that the five-day forecast for the weather in Europe was highly uncertain. That would give us a day or two to get in a plane and fly to the place where new measurements would maximally reduce that uncertainty in the five-day forecast. Does that make sense? That's kind of a critical point. So those are called adaptive observations, adaptive sensing, uh, if you're in the engineering world. And anyway, uh, the story here is that um, they did this. They did this in the field campaign. They found locations uh, that would have the biggest impact. And then they, uh, I think they may have actually been in the ob stream in real time at the time. I don't know if Takamas or, or uh, Johania, you remember? Sure. I, I think these measurements were actually in the real time observation stream that the operational center is assimilated. But I can't remember for sure. Right, so this, this is, uh, the moral of the story is, it was a great theory, it was actually tested with real assets, but the impact didn't work out uh, as predicted. And I think in the years after that, uh, that lack of success was repeated at great expense, and it was discovered that the main reason for that is uh, that the data assimilation system that was used operationally was not the same one as was used to pick the locations to target. And so that's a key thing, is if you're using a data simulation system to pick the targets, it better be the same one that assimilates the measurements. Uh, okay, so uh, then another uh, fundamental contribution came in 2004 by uh, Ralph Langland and Nancy Baker at the Naval Research Lab. Uh, they found a way, or they proposed a theory that, that they then applied with, with real uh, observations to estimate the impact of measurements on the future forecast using an adjoint model and the adjoint of the data simulation system as well. And I'm going to talk about my, t my take on their theory here. Their paper is uh, not that, that easy for me to read anyway, uh, but I'll distill down the essence of it here. Uh, I'm going to put a contribution of my own in, in the list here. I have an allergic reaction to adjoint models. 
Uh, they are easy to write down. Uh, <laughs> you, I know Johan is cut from the same cloth here. Uh, they're not so easy to implement. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. Uh, it involves transpose operations of numerical models going backwards in time. So, you know, it's a little bit like the old Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers comments. You know, if you think uh, Fred Astaire was dancing uh, very elaborately and very beautifully, Ginger Rogers was doing the same thing backwards and in high heels. So that's essentially what uh, adjoint modeling is like for me. Anyway, so we came up with a way uh, statistically to come up with the same thing that the adjoint model has without needing the adjoint model. And it involves ensemble estimation. Uh, Eugenia was on the same track around the same time and has, through a sequence of papers, uh, generalized that very nicely. And I'll, I'll tell you about some of that. Uh, so this is kind of my summary, a distillation of the forecast sensitivity, the adjoint sensitivity theory, um, as you might find it in the Langland and Baker papers or in other adjoint sensitivity papers. Uh, and here's the key. Uh, the key is we need some scalar summary measure. We need some way to measure impact. We need some way to quantify it, right? There needs to be something that we can put our hands on. And there's a functional that does that, OK? So if you give me the state and you tell me what's most important to you, my functional will turn out a number that measures what matters to you. Does that make sense? It could be energy. Uh, there's been an obsession with energy, kinetic energy, uh, in folks who do this. So that's a very common uh, norm. Uh, I should note that it turns out to be relatively straightforward to generalize this to an arbitrary number of j's to turn this into a vector. It just bumps up the dimensionality of everything I'm going to talk about by one. And I think you can really only do it in the ensemble realm, not in the adjoint realm. So I'm not going to talk about it. Just know that that option is there. All right, so that's one thing. We need to decide what it is we're trying to measure. And the answers depend on that. So if you're going to optimize for sea level pressure averaged over Europe, that's the thing you care about. That's not going to be an optimal performance measure for rainfall in New York City. Okay? If you want optimal rainfall in New York City, that's a different J, and you're going to get a different answer. That's, I know I'm going over this many, many times, but it's really, really a key point. This is not a unique thing. It depends upon what it is you're trying to accomplish. Okay, so the next ingredient is a forecast model, and I've written it here as a nonlinear map from uh, the state at the initial condition, x sub 0, to some future time t. So this is just simply the action of the forecast model. And it has some linearization. And this could be as fancy as you like. It could be a tangent linearization. I think you've done that in the, uh, the practical. Or no, maybe you will do it in the practical. Anyway, it's just a leading or Taylor approximation around some control trajectory. That is, we now have a linear map achieved by a matrix that again does the same thing. It takes us from the initial time to the forecast time where we're going to evaluate this metric. We're also going to linearize this J. So things like kinetic energy norms, energy norms are quadratic, uh, because we're interested in how this thing changes depending on what we do with the measurements. So uh, again, doing a leading order Taylor approximation, uh, this is accomplished by the gradient of j with respect to the state at the forecast time times the changes in the forecast state. Okay? That's just straight up uh, first order Taylor. And then using our forecast model, uh, our linear forecast model, we can trade the forecast for a map from the initial conditions. So now we have something that's relating a change in the initial conditions where we're going to have the measurements. Uh, to our for performance measure at the forecast time. And uh, through a little minor trick, if we pull this L back into the transpose operation with this gradient, we can get uh, what's called the gradient sensitivity with respect to the initial time. So that's simply this. 
we take the transpose of this, we get back to here. All right, so this is the adjoint sensitivity gradient, and it's given by a map of the sensitivity gradient at the forecast time by the transpose of the linear model. So this is called an adjoint model. Maybe I will use the blackboard. So in practice, the way the model works is if we go one time step at a time, if I have my delta x of 0, can anybody see that if you're not in the first three rows? I better use a larger font. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Back row, can you get it? All right. Uh, so the very first step in the forecast model, we can call it L1. So that's, that's a linear step with our tangent linear model, one step into the future, right? And then we take the next step into the future with the second part of that linear operator until we get back to the end, the final step. We are now at the forecast time. So we have, sorry, my font is shrinking here. OK, right? So this is a sequence of operations, matrix multiplications, that get us from here, the initial condition to the forecast state. So L transpose. reverses that operation, right? Sorry, I'm running out of room. But you know, the way matrix transpose as a product works, it's the reverse order of the transposes multiplied together, right? So what do we see here? The action of this adjoint model goes from the final time and marches backward, Ginger Rogers, right? If you know musicals from the 50s, maybe not. Uh, back to the initial time. And that is exactly how these things work. So we need the adjoint of the code. And apparently, this is important from those uh, high priests and priestesses who uh, do this sort of thing. There are the adjoint equations. You don't discretize the adjoint equations. You do the adjoint of the code. And that way, you ensure it has the right mathematical properties. Um, so it's the tangent linear model. You take its adjoint. And then you run it backwards in time. You got that? I'm not crazy about it either, which is why I have a different way of doing this. That's the way it works. And they actually have these things. And that's, you know, if you're doing that, you probably used this yesterday in the practical session, right? If you were doing 4D VAR, did you do 4D VAR yesterday? Or was it just 3D VAR? Ah, OK. 4D VAR today? Where's Steve? No 4D VAR? OK. Uh, <laughs> I've coded this once. That was, that was enough. I, I've, yeah, I've walked this road, and I'm not crazy about it. Yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, the level of comfort has to do with um, when things become nonlinear. So you know, anything's in a smooth, continuous system where the Taylor series exists and converges and all that kind of stuff. Anything is linear if you pick a small enough interval. Right? You can always fit a line to it. The question is, how long does that take? So. Uh, in the weather prediction, in the global prediction, well, so how does the European Center do it? They use a nine-hour window, right? And they don't resolve really small scales. So they do their analysis on relatively coarse scales compared to their forward forecast model. 
So roughly on that time frame, it's believed that the dynamics on large-ish scales are pretty well approximated linearly, tangent linearly, right? So it, de it depends upon what we're linearizing about. We're not linearizing about the mean climate. We're linearizing about a controlled trajectory that maps over that nine-hour period. So where this gets sticky is if you go down to a scale where you suddenly start to resolve motions where the time scale is much faster and they reach saturation, convection, for example. So if all of a sudden you start resolving convective elements and they have saturation amplitudes that they reach in half an hour, the tangent linear approximation doesn't work. It's a good reason to stay away from those scales if you're trying to do the global problem. So I think that's probably more than you wanted to hear about my comfort about it, but that's, uh, in a nutshell, I think those are the practical issues. And if you use this technique, these are things you'll have to worry about. Uh, you'll have to worry about over what time scale is my system linear enough to apply these tools.